Um, and I'm just going to briefly introduce him and then uh, leave 48 minutes for you to enjoy uh, what he has to say. Uh, Will Jensen, uh, graduate of this college in what year? 78. A class of 78 um, with a professional and grown-up career in art history uh, and in finance. And that's not an easy combination, and he does it with grace and with ease. Uh, he, like Sharon Oster, is a uh, standout teacher <coughs> in the School of Management MBA program. Uh, he directs uh, the International Center for Finance, uh, and his the Catholicity of his interests, which you'll see uh, in his slides and in his uh, analysis, uh, is uh, truly impressive. Please help me welcome Will Gaston. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, I'm uh, I was thrilled with the idea of this course. So. Um, was really looking forward, as Doug was describing, the idea of the, cl uh, of the course and um, his plans for it and what you all have been doing. It seems like a fantastic uh, thing. So uh, the question in my mind was, what could I add today that would be of interest to you? And I thought what I would do is focus a little bit on the historical backgrounds to the current <coughs> crisis. I know you've been doing some reading about the, uh, the current crisis and its relationship to the ideas of capitalism and so forth. I thought a little bit of historical foundation uh, would be a good thing to, to, to lead off with and, and uh, <clears throat> give you an idea of uh, how old these financial crises are. This is a cuneiform tablet from the Old Babylonian period, roughly 1600 BC. It's, um, it's uh, a, a loan so that uh, <clears throat> It was uh, created with uh, the terms of the loan on one side, and, and, and typically, although you can't see it from this side, you'll have people that are witnesses to the loan on the other side. So debt has been around uh, for a long time. And one interesting feature about debt is that usually uh, when you, um, if you're a lender, you like to have some collateral. The collateral for debts in this time period often were human capital. In other words, if you defaulted on your loan, the uh, borrower could seize you for three years and your family and, make, and you'd have to work the loan off. So uh, that, um, <clears throat> that sort of debt slavery um, was something that began uh, quite early in, in uh, human culture. You had, when you had, with that debt slavery, <clears throat> there would be periods when people would get themselves into a terrible mess and uh, let's say crops failed and lots of farmers wouldn't be able to pay off their loans, you'd have lots of the society in deep debt. And um, the, the uh, king, <clears throat> periodically, would decree all debts null and void. So wiping the slate clean. So here is a, here's a, uh, a fragment of an edict by Samsu Iluna, who was the son of Hammurabi, uh, who, by the way, lived in the city um, that uh, Yale has had a long time expedition to excavate uh, <clears throat> uh, called uh, Tel Leilan. Um, anyway, this is um, releasing everybody from, uh, from, uh, from bankruptcy in the form of debt slavery, but <clears throat> the issue there, of course, is where do you draw the line? Which debts do you release? And, 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 and if you just want to take people out of slavery, but you want to maintain a financial system, how do you, how do you differentiate. Uh, that's the solution to that problem, uh, at least in the, from the view of, of uh, writers in antiquity, particularly uh, Aristotle, who wrote about Solon, um, <clears throat> um, it c comes in the form of, a, of another major debt crisis. Um, when Solon of Athens became the uh, autarch, or whatever you want to call it, the leader of Athens, it was about 600 BC or so, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And he was brought in because there was a terrible crisis. Uh, much like the crises in the Middle East, there, it was a period when, when uh, Athenian citizens had been seized uh, for debts. And these were debts incurred typically by farmers. 
and then they've been sold off outside of Athens. They just sell them offshore, <laughs> export, the, export these uh, debt slaves, and it created a terrible crisis. <clears throat> so um, Solomon was from a wealthy family. Uh, he was elected by the sort of the rich people in Athens. They thought that he would uh, stand up for property rights and uh, he wouldn't let the financial system go to hell just because um, of the uh, pain inflicted on the, on the poor uh, portion of society. Um, what he did made nobody happy. He said, we're gonna preserve property rights, we're gonna preserve the right to contract, but the only thing we're gonna forbid is the right to sell yourself into slavery. So he drew the line um, at that, <coughs> at that uh, debt slavery point. And um, ever afterwards, people, uh, Athenians would look at him, he sort of was like the George Washington of Athens. And 200 years later, people would write about this moment in time when he, 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 um, he made the differentiation uh, between <coughs> the financial system and the, and the system of, of human slavery. It wasn't not to say that slaves didn't exist, but the uh, ability to contract on your, on your freedom uh, was not allowed after, after uh, Solon. I'm gonna skip forward through a lot of exciting financial history. Those of you that like that kind of stuff might consider taking, I, I teach a course seminar, senior seminar in financial history uh, in the spring, so uh, if you are interested in those topics, um, love to have you uh, participate. I'm gonna skip forward to our debt crisis because uh, I worry, I stay up late nights worrying that we're getting ourselves back into a debt slavery situation. Um, and uh, the recent uh, <clears throat> code that we've, we've uh, the bankruptcy code has made it hard for people to shift off their debts or shake off their debts, which is the term that Solon used. Uh, <clears throat> Solon used, it was called sis octhera or something like this, a shaking off, like an earthquake. Um, but I'm gonna skip forward to 1892 and have you read this quote because it, 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 it lets you have some sense of where the policy for uh, real estate uh, mortgage lending in the United States might have come from. Um, the occasion for this was a big festive dinner. Um, might have been at Delmonico's restaurant. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where, I don't think it says here, but in New York. And a bunch of guys uh, in the real estate business in New York were getting together and were, they were really kicking off uh, an attempt to create a real estate exchange in New York City. In the exchange, um, there had been something like a real estate exchange where properties were listed and brokers uh, um, were admitted and so forth. The idea that they were coming to was that they needed an exchange for real estate securities. Like real estate securities that we have now, are, are, are um, a lot of them are things like, oh, You've heard lots about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, and, uh, and subprime loans and um, uh, commercial mortgage-backed <coughs> securities and things like that. Well, <clears throat> these guys were thinking about setting up an exchange to trade um, uh, debt. Uh, maybe some equity too, actually, in New York. New York would be the center of real estate um, trading. What were they gonna trade? Well, here's a picture, just a piece of a bond. Um, uh, that uh, of the kind they were going to trade. These things are incredibly beautiful. The New York, uh, <clears throat> the U.S. Banknote Company made bonds for, made stocks and bonds and money for all the countries in the world, and uh, they had incredibly detailed filigrees and and uh, and these beautiful motifs and so forth. <clears throat> it wasn't to make these things more attractive to customers. All of this detail was really to prevent counterfeiting because uh, you, you know, if, you could repl if you could counterfeit a bond like this, you could take it in and, um, and, and uh, you could take it in and get coupons. So what's this bond? It's a $500 bond. It's issued to finance something called <clears throat> 44 Wall Street Corporation. Um, and it's the Manhattan Company building. So 44 Wall Street is still a building in Manhattan. Uh, I don't know if anybody here might have worked there during the summer, uh, but um, there was a corporation that was set up to build and operate one single building. 
and there was some equity capital in the corporation, and there was some debt in the corporation. The debt was issued to the public in bonds. So um, uh, you, you and I could go out and we could buy these bonds, <clears throat> and then the coupons, the money that would come in from the bonds, is money that would come in uh, based upon the rents that were being paid by people that leased space in this 44 Wall Street building. So <clears throat> this is a fairly extraordinary kind of security, just particularly because we don't have securities like this anymore. I mean, there are some bonds that have been issued uh, against buildings, um, and, and uh, I'm thinking now of um, uh, things like uh, in London, you have this vast project in, uh, in the uh, Canary Wharf, and uh, that was financed with some really interesting debt. But one-to-one, -one, building to, to bond, really we don't have uh, in the modern day. This one, by the way, was issued one month or so, right? Right after, a few, not long after the great crash. Here's a little bit about this market. <clears throat> the market was nothing much, this is, a, this is the total accumulated amount of outstanding debt based on the face value. So the face value of that one was $500. Um, you'd multiply that times the total number of bonds. Um, you add all of those bonds that existed up, and this, these are the numbers you're getting, 100 million, 200 million, so on. <clears throat> so you see that even in 1913, there were some of these bonds uh, being issued. Um, and <clears throat> um, then uh, there are two companies here that we're tracking, New York Title and Mortgage Company and Lawyers, uh, Lawyers Mortgage Company. <clears throat> These two companies actually served as guarantors for debt. <clears throat> In particular, actually, what they would do, they, the, the, about eight companies got together, or didn't get together, but eight companies offered a service. They would take a residential mortgage, put a guarantee on it, and then, <coughs> that, and then sell that mortgage to somebody else. So just like you have one bond, one, one co commercial building, uh, you know, uh, offered through bonds. You also had one uh, house then guaranteed and offered, uh, one mortgage for one house then guaranteed and offered for sale. These firms also began to pool these mortgages. And uh, you'd pool together a hundred or so of these mortgages or a thousand of these mortgages, put a guarantee on them, and then sell those, uh, those uh, pooled claims out uh, as uh, bonds. So this picture represents not just those commercial bonds that I showed you, but also residential securities. <clears throat> and you can see what happened is that they were coming along, doing fine, small part of the business, and then in the 20s, both of them picked up uh, dramatically. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the First World War was an important hinge point in the history of this particular kinds of financial innovation. Um, the First World War was the first U.S. war that was financed by massive issues of, of, uh, of uh, war bonds. And it became a patriotic duty to buy war bonds to finance the, the effort. When the war was over and those bonds were, were, uh, were, uh, uh, were reclaimed by the government, they were paid off by the government, people had been used to owning securities. A whole operation to sell these securities had existed, a sales uh, operation. Uh, so then um, uh, the uh, broker said, what else are we going to sell? <clears throat> and uh, real estate bonds became a really important uh, new product. So you can see this might have been driven by demand, actually, for investment product in a, in a marketing system um, that had grown um, uh, for savings bonds uh, earlier you know, during the war. Nevertheless, you can see this stuff really take off and, uh, and peak in around 19, uh, late 20s. Uh, these, that was cumulative. This is just new, uh, new issues. There you see the, the, uh, the drop um, around the crash time uh, even more dramatically. Okay. Um, this is a picture of uh, the, those plotting those number of new issues for commercial, bond, for, for commercial properties against uh, new buildings. 
And here we only took a look at new buildings that were 70 meters high or so. So, uh, so, so we're looking at really tall buildings. Um, this is a time period when uh, the skyscraper was really born in the 19, 1890s and uh, really got going in the early part of the 20th century. So uh, a question that, um, that we've begun to ask ourselves is, um, maybe the skyscraper was a response to the emergence of a new capital market for fixed income securities. Maybe the financing drove the desire for big buildings rather than the, the other way around. I mean, New York and other cities had existed for a long time without skyscrapers. Um, and there's a lot of interesting theory about how skyscrapers uh, were a kind of a result of changes in zoning laws in some places and so forth. Um, but if you think about it, London did fine without skyscrapers for many years. <clears throat> Paris, London, other great capitals of the world did fine without skyscrapers. Why would you suddenly have this uh, sort of immediate blossoming of skyscrapers largely coincident with an emergence of a capital market and an ability to sell these, these bonds? <clears throat> um, uh, so, um, by the way, how would... Is there any way you can think of testing that theory about which, uh, um, if, I, if my theory was finance made skys sky skyscrapers <clears throat> or finance led to big buildings, how would you test that theory if you had some data? Come on guys, let's take a well, shot. Anybody, I want to cold call on somebody. But uh, your chances of being cold called. Um, yes, back there. That's okay, I can hear. Yes. Yeah. Um, so look across country uh, and, and across sectionally. You'd like to find conditions that, uh, that um, maybe didn't have this um, financial explosion. Okay. Does everybody know what endogeneity is? So, uh, everybody who's an econ major and you're a, a senior or a junior, you probably know. Okay. Other than that, you probably think it's some kind of horrible skin disease. <laughs> uh, endogeneity means that, um, um, that the, the factors that you're studying could actually be, uh, there, there could be some reverse causality going on, or there could be some, uh, a, a common unidentified factor that could be driving <laughs> both of them, and you have to find some way of sorting this out. Uh, so the question is, so the one way to do this is to find some independent um, um, phenomena to, to observe. <clears throat> That's what's being proposed. Any other suggestions? Well, um, Pearson College. Uh, I was just going to say that you could <coughs> always uh, not only look at the rest of the world, but look at uh, in the United States, the development of these types of towns, the number of skyscrapers like this, and I would wager that probably uh, the first skyscrapers were not financed with these types of bonds, which would seem to indicate that there was some other factor, at least initially, driving skyscraper construction. Okay. So, um, so if you can find a skyscraper that was a, if the first skyscraper was, if you can show that it wasn't financed by these bonds, then you could prove that it's possible to have skyscrapers without the financing. Uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a way to test the basic proposition. You know, it's a, it, it, it may be, um, <clears throat> may not, you can prove that it's not a necessary condition if you can find one example. Okay, one more idea. Who's an SOM student? Oh, we've got one here. No? Uh, you here in the, yes, gray, uh, yeah, charcoal uh, t-shirt. Any um, idea? Other than taking a survey looking at multiple cities and have when skyscrapers started to be built and when the, this capital work developed, uh, I don't think I can really add anything else. That's good. Take a look cross-sectionally at the different cities. 
see if they have maybe access to capital markets different, different, diff differently across the cities and see what the timing is. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what we have been doing. Um, we figured that uh, one interesting issue here is, has to do with the size of the bond issue. If you have a really, um, if you have a tiny building and you want to go to the public capital markets, um, do you think an investment bank is gonna, <laughs> gonna uh, give you the time of day? Absolutely not. Um, there are basic uh, issues of economies of scale that have to do with financing. Uh, so, um, so what we did is we said, let's take a look at the size of the bond issue. We also looked at the height of the building, but the size of the bond issue is the legitimate uh, thing to look at. And presuming that the bigger the, the bigger the bond issue, the bigger the building. And then we asked, is the interest rate on the bond, that is the, uh, the, the rate at which the bond was issued, was that lower or higher for bigger, uh, for, for, for bigger buildings? And what we found pretty strikingly is that the bigger the building, the lower the, the yield, the lower the cost of capital. And so if you're thinking about, if you're a developer and you've got a plot and you could build two small buildings or one big building, or you could finance it all at once or one at a time, and you know that you're gonna be able to have a lower cost of capital, what are you gonna do? You're gonna build one really big building. So you can see, you know, finance has this potential maybe to possibly even distort the way that, the, the way that uh, cities develop um, because of I simple issues like cost of capital. And uh, those guys sitting around uh, the uh, toasting themselves that we saw in 1892, the creation of that market for those securities may have an, had an influence on, on, the, on the New York skyline uh, during that time period. Here's just a picture, by the way, of uh, of the tall buildings in New York and when they were all constructed. And you see huge boom during this period. <clears throat> and then a long malaise during the middle of the century during wartime. And then the market picked back up. I'll tell you one sort of sh shocking thing to me is that the, the residential mortgage-backed security market completely disappeared in the 30s and that commercial uh, one building, one bond market completely disappeared at least by 1940 or so. I mean, there's still bonds that may exist. When I say disappeared, they stopped new issues and you couldn't easily trade these things. They didn't change hands. So there are bonds that are still paying out. I have a, a, a friend whose mother, whose family has some securities that were used to build the Empire State Building. They're still paying them money and they're proud to own these things, but these are the fossils of the, uh, of the financial world. So what you had is this extraordinary period of innovation in, in, in financing of real estate. Um, the shift in the way that people were able to access mortgage money and, the, and a change in the way that developers thought about how they would build buildings. And all of it came to a grinding, horrible end uh, as a result of the Great Depression. Did that market cause the crash? Or was it a, it w w was, w was, was, did the fallout from the crash destroy that market? That's the question we're asking ourselves today, right? We're saying, well, subprime obviously caused the big problem that we're in. And um, so uh, the foolish bankers, uh, idiots that wanted to uh, own their own home and were willing to borrow to the hilt, this uh, horrible evil brew of, uh, of, uh, of uh, people that uh, couldn't plan ahead and bankers that were willing to give them, uh, give them enough rope that they could hang themselves. That's sort of the theme, the drumbeat uh, we're hearing. You know, you, you sort of wonder maybe that the, the mortgage market is a, um, is a casualty rather than a, a, uh, a cause of this crash. <clears throat> So uh, Doug has given you some readings um, that uh, uh, kind of a, a hard uh, reading to slog through, but um, because uh, although if you're, again, if you're an econ major, you should be able to snap your way right through this thing because it's got a bunch of regressions and tables and, 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 uh, and plots. But <clears throat> let me just tell you a little bit about the idea of this paper. I'm doing it with, uh, with uh, Liang Peng, who's um, a colleague of mine. He's now at Colorado. Um, and, Jackie Yen, who's a doctoral student at Yale, and Jackie 
um, uh, is studying to be a finance professor, but she also uh, worked in uh, Wall Street for quite some time and knows a lot about, about these capital markets, particularly about mortgage data. <clears throat> And the question we're asking is a simple one. Like many scholars right now, we want to try and help uh, the world uh, understand what the causes of this crisis are. But we're in a position that we don't, I'm not quite sure I know what the causes are. And so the way that we're dealing with that is we're gathering some data and we're looking at it and putting questions to this data. Um, the data that we got are housing indexes. Those come from Bob Schiller, uh, and Chip Case, who developed these. When I was a graduate student here, Bob and Chip Case had just started building these indexes of housing. Um, and so uh, we really have data going back. Uh, I think they stretch back, their data start from about, well, late 80s or so. And what they do is they take sales of housing. They take houses that have been sold twice in a given city, and they get thousands of those, and you can sort of figure out what's the best measure of return to explain all of those repeated sales. So it's actually transactions-based measures of housing. Uh, we've got those for all the, the city, the big cities in the country, and metropolitan statistical areas, about 320 or 330 of these. Then we have some additional city-level information we can compare that to. Then we've got um, mortgage issuance by city, and finally, and this is pretty amazing, for one year, for 2006, we took all the mortgages that were issued in the entire country, and we have uh, detailed data about those mortgages. Uh, so <clears throat> we figured somewhere buried in this uh, data, we're going to be able to get some sense of what, what the problem was. Okay, here's a chart. <clears throat> On this axis is past price growth from 1999 to 2005, end of 2005. So what did we do? We took each one of those cities, we look at that index that Bob Schiller had created, and we said, um, we just plotted the total growth that that index had undergone over the period, over the, over the, over the 2000s up through 2005. So we wanted to look at the hot markets. Which were the really hot markets? Which ones had really grown a lot? And you could see some of them had grown by almost a factor of three. Las Vegas, uh, there are parts of California and Nevada and Florida that were just off the charts having grown like an amazing amount. And by the way, there are a lot of cities where there wasn't much growth at all. The whole cluster here of cities that had grown by a factor of well, they'd grown 30%, but that was over a, a long length of time. They're probably growing at less than 10% per year. Well, 10% per year over this time period was actually a pretty good investment when you think about it. The stock market was doing terribly. We just got off this horrible bender from the tech bubble. People said stocks are terrible. I don't want to invest in them anymore. Bonds were a decent investment, but there were people really wondering, what are we going to put my money in? And a lot of people thought, you know, housing, although a modest growth in many of these cities, housing might not be such a bad thing. When you think about it, if you're sitting in the year 2000, having just been burned by the tech bubble, and you're saying, Where, how am I going to save for myself and my family? You know, why not put your money in your house? At least you can watch the asset, you can take care of it, you can improve it, Granted, you have to pay taxes on it, and you have to fix it up, and uh, it's not very liquid, okay? But you balance these things off. It might be, you know, uh, it, it was the new asset class of the era. It was an idea, of, it was not a speculative asset, it was a savings-related asset. Okay, how about this other axis? <clears throat> Subprime approvals in 2006, uh, the log of the dollar amount in thousands. We looked at all of these, uh, we looked at the rate, city by city, of subprime approvals. That is, people that had applied for a subprime mortgage and then um, been, approved for, uh, been approved. A subprime mortgage means you don't qualify to get a prime mortgage. To qualify for a prime mortgage, you have to have steady source of income, uh, you have to have a good credit rating, 
Um, there has to be a good loan to value ratio. That means you're not asked, trying to borrow too much. You have to have a house that's appraised in such a way that the loan to value ratio is a legitimate measure that some the bank can trust. If you're not in that circumstance, then you're in sub world of subprime, okay? So what we see here is subprime approvals were more frequent in markets where the prices had gone up. Why would that be? Okay, I'll ask this as a general question. Why would you expect that? Yes? When the prices are higher, more people are going to have some loans. Yeah. When the prices are higher, assuming that it becomes, the cities get to go up with that, you're going to have people that have lower incomes relative to the value of the house. They're buying because the average price is higher. The amount they're going to borrow is also going to be higher. Okay. This sounds like endogeneity. It's good. Um, people, uh, the houses will go up too fast. They, the, a normal loan, they can't, they can't get a normal loan to, to buy a house. They might have been able to buy 10 years ago with a prime loan. So therefore, you've got a uh, necessity of more demand uh, for subprime loans. These are approvals, though. That means the bankers had to say yes. Okay? So the bankers had to go along with this uh, to, to get this graph. Yeah? So when prices are high, Rising, there's this almost there's a market contagion that prices can't fall down; they can just go upwards. So people in general just start taking more risks, and financial institutions which grant these subprime loans also become overtly optimistic. They all feel that prices have to go up, and they feel that the real value of houses have increased. And that sounds like that sounds like irrational exuberance. Okay. Um, so. Um, it's easy to say that they're irrational. It's harder to say that they're rational. Okay. It would be nice to know if, uh, um, first of all, Bob Schiller is a good friend of mine, and uh, I, I, I uh, love his book, and I, I love his wonderful intuition about when the cart is going off the track. Uh, and he tends to be right, so it's hard to deny that Irrational exuberance is behind a lot of the big messes we're in. Um, <clears throat> however, as an economist, you sort of want to see how much you can get with the, with the rational stories first, and then have the remainder be the, the exuberance. So we're going to push on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I interpret this, sorry, I interpret this chart as prices of asset values are going up and subprime approvals are going up at the same time. That means the structure has to be increasingly leveraged. That's, that's the only way to fill the gap. You're not saying that subprime uh, incomes are going up, but you're saying the approvals are going up, so something has to fill that gap mm -hmm. in purchase price, and that means they're being more heavily leveraged. Yeah, I think that there's some evidence uh, uh, consistent with your, with your observation. It's amazing how much you can get out of staring at a graph like that, because buried behind it are a whole bunch of decisions by individuals applying and by bankers um, uh, deciding. Um, I'm gonna show you a picture just from one city. This is from uh, Seattle. <clears throat> and what we've done here is we've gone from 2006. Um, what we've done is we've said, let's extrapolate the housing price from two, in 2006. Let's extrapolate it and then use some econometrics to figure out how far down we think it could go and how far up it could go. Those are those two lines there. Um, and then there's a wiggly line which shows you exactly what housing prices did. Um, and so, uh, actually, I'm going to show you some more in just a second. I want you to understand the geography of this first. Um, these are confidence bands. And if you're thinking, if you're a banker and you're going to make a loan, the first thing you want to know is, is this loan to value ratio going to um, change a lot over the time period of the loan? A lot of subprime loans sort of reset after three years and so forth. You'd like to, uh, to, to, to have some confidence, or at least know how far down the value could go, so that you, you know, because you're worried about the loan value being higher, than, the loan being higher than the, than the house value. That's called underwater. So you're worried about the value of the asset, bless you. So this picture is really putting confidence bounds on the value of the asset, and um, <clears throat> 
what this is saying is that in 2006, if you just extrapolated the prices from that time, you'd get a kind of a flat line and then you, didn't, you wouldn't find any reason to expect that over the next three years, prices could drop more than, than 20% or so. So uh, only one time out of 20 would you get a, a shock more than 20%. <clears throat> Oops. How would you get that? Oops, here we are. Now here's a whole, here are a whole bunch of these, uh, uh, the same exercise. And I'll tell you a little bit about the exercise. Here's where the econometrics comes in. <clears throat> we take those indexes that Schiller gave us for all the different uh, cities, these major cities, and then we did, it, um, we did something that any uh, red-blooded econometrician would do. We did an autoregression, which says uh, that past growth uh, estimates the relationship between past growth and future growth. And what you see from all of these housing indexes is that past trends seem to be followed. Uh, th there seems to be a huge amount of momentum and inertia in these, these movements of these markets. Uh, even when they're going down, once they start, here's, here's uh, Minneapolis. It was going up like this, incredible autocorrelation in past trends. And then, of course, once it starts going down, it just keeps going down. This is not a random walk. Housing doesn't follow a random walk by any stretch of the imagination. It's very, very predictable. You could predict, the models tell you, that you could predict the housing uh, prices with a huge degree of confidence for three years out, just given about 20 or 20, you know, 15 or 20 years worth of, of, of past data. So, <clears throat> Uh, so all of these pictures show you that for each city, there's a line, which is the past price increase, that's uh, not Las Vegas, went up like crazy at one point. Then there are the two confidence bands. Then there's the orange bar saying, what do we expect the, pr the price trend to be? But it's not the expectation that's so important, it's this lower bound, how bad can it get? If you're a banker, that's the thing that tells you, you know, uh, is this loan going to be a disaster? And every single one of these cities, virtually, the, the actual price just plunged right through the, the, the banker's confidence bands. So uh, if you've got a model that's an, uh, an econometric model that's based on past price trends, and you ran that model in 2006, you wouldn't have been able to predict any of this crash. You would have felt pretty confident that when you were writing those mortgages, even the even the subprime mortgage, that, uh, that those were good bonds. That was a good loan. You know, a subprime loan doesn't mean that the house is bad. It just means that the lender is bad. It's a subprime uh, borrower is bad. It's a subprime borrower, not a subprime house. So you say, look, what's the worst that could happen? My borrower can't, uh, we get into some trouble, my borrower can't make the payments on the house, then the bank has to repossess the house, but if the house price isn't gonna move much, then what the heck, we'll just turn around and sell the house. <clears throat> so we've got good collateral. Um, and, <clears throat> and we all know what happened. Uh, that model turned out, those, that econometric model turned out to be a complete uh, disaster. <clears throat> Actually, one more point on this. What do you need for an econometric model? <clears throat> Aside from an econometrics textbook, SAS, I use R, I did this in this program called R, Stata, some people use that. What else do you need to run an econometric model? This isn't a trick question. Um, you have a blue scarf on. What do you need to run a, to estimate a model like this? Data. data. Okay. You need data. And um, so the data come from Robert Schiller. And the fact is, unless you have those housing indexes, you can't run this model. The irony of these indexes is that although they opened a world to us of what housing prices do, they also made econometricians believe that they could estimate the risk associated with the housing. Before we had those indexes, we couldn't do any prediction. We couldn't do any of this sophisticated uh, mathematical calculations. We couldn't walk into a, to a, 
uh, to the president of the bank and say, look, we've done a value at risk calculation using these fantastic indexes that tell us that the probability of us losing more than 20% of, of our capital um, is uh, 0 0.005. You couldn't do it. Suddenly, with this data, a little bit of information is a really dangerous thing when you, you put it in front of somebody that knows how to crank through a regression. And uh, so it's a terrible thing to blame Bob Schiller, the person that forecasts this crash, to blame him, on the other hand, for providing the, the, the matches to allow people to burn down the house. It was a failure of models, but you can't run the models without the data. Okay, I'll just give you a little bit more flavor for what we do. <coughs> we run a whole bunch of regressions. We're looking for relationships. But mainly what we do is we divide things up into a world of the demand side for, for loans and the supply side for loans. And what we want to ask is, was it the stupid or avaricious banker that drove the crash? Or was it the stupid or and, av or, and avaricious homeowner borrower that drove the crash? Neither or both, okay? And uh, here we have subprime uh, mortgages and prime mortgages. <clears throat> and so um, roughly when we look at relationships, here's what we find. <clears throat> uh, we find for both subprime and prime, the numbers of uh, applications and measured by the dollars and numbers of applications <clears throat> were increasing in those home prices. So when the home price goes up, you make your forecast of what the worst scenario might be and if you had a positive trend, you would think that um, you know, uh, lenders would be more comfortable that with the bottom line, uh, uh, that they'd be able to get their money out. And <clears throat> so might borrowers, if they think, hey, look, I'm buying a house. I'm putting every dime I have into it, but the trends look pretty good. I should be able to get my money out the other end. Um, <clears throat> then you ought to see a positive relationship between past price increases and um, applications. Uh, uh, however what you want to slice it. Somebody mentioned, you mentioned leverage, okay? Exactly, uh, that's exactly what happened. <coughs> uh, d uh, there was a greater loan to income uh, requests for, um, higher leverage requests for both of those two. Um, people actually also tended to, um, <coughs> this is loan to income uh, measure of leverage, not loan to value. Uh, the loan to value actually also, um, <clears throat> the value to loan went up. Why is that? People felt comfortable putting more of their own money into houses. And then people bought more expensive houses, but the endogeneity issue, who mentioned that? That was a really important point. There, there were more expensive houses, so that was inevitable. Okay, so were people being foolish? Well, that's a hard thing to say. They looked at, at it as an Savings opportunity, you could say this was a, this was a crisis driven by over, or too much demand for savings. It's just that it didn't save, in, just that the savings vehicle was the house. <coughs> um, were they irrationally exuberant? Well, if you look at those trends, maybe I would have been fooled by the same trend as well. How about on the banker side? Now the banker's job is to say no, okay? To, to reject loans. <clears throat> and what do we find here? Now the weirdest thing that we completely, that completely shocked us is that approvals didn't really, the rate of approvals for subprime, once we controlled for a lot of things, didn't change as much as that we had expected. And in fact, the rate for approvals for prime actually went down, which is strange. That means bankers were getting tougher. Well, they're only getting tougher because the, the demands were, were increasing, okay? So um, you have to look at this as the environment was changing because the, the, the demand for loans was increasing a lot, but uh, so that, so that their, their, their approval rates were actually going down. But it really doesn't look like, the, the, that it doesn't look like irrational exuberance on the banker's part um, for uh, prime loans. <coughs> um, and mostly on the prime side, b bankers t t appear to be behaving really pretty rationally. <clears throat> um, 
less so on the, on the, on the subprime side. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, loan to income ratio, that was going up. Um, <clears throat> uh, the value to loan ratio was going down. In other words, people were having to put up uh, the, the, the less of their own cash to own the home and people were having to, um, uh, people were getting uh, higher loans with lower incomes. So if anything, I think what we're beginning to convince ourselves using this loan data that the subprime uh, market and the prime market were two uh, kind of slightly disjointed markets with uh, different decision processes um, in, uh, in operation. Both sides had securitization going on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, we haven't attacked the question of whether securitizable loans were driving all of this, but other people have been, have been asking that question. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, we certainly found evidence of high, of increase, increasing um, demand uh, in prices. So it could be that people are chasing after, chasing the uh, trends. Um, <clears throat> but it could be also that uh, the expectation of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the um, liquidation value of the house was going up and made them feel safer about the borrowing. Uh, the riskiness of mortgage applications is increasing in past price. <clears throat> Everybody wants to buy more expensive homes, <clears throat> um, but um, <clears throat> uh, uh, that we documented. And as I mentioned, there's this disjunction between the, the two. So that's sort of a kind of a flavor for how uh, a professor and some graduate students look at the crisis. You've been reading Posner. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, um, you see how somebody tries to put the whole thing together. Well, our, our goal was to kind of uh, deconstruct it. Let me see if there's, well, that's just a kind of more documentary evidence of what I was talking about. <clears throat> um, and uh, um, I don't know, I've looked at history, been interested in that, and uh, looked at current data. So. Um, with that, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but. Yeah, I think there's time for one or two questions. Back there, Notre Dame. Um, on one of your previous slides, you mentioned that the supply side seemed to be uh, almost constrained, and, and you seem to attribute that to, um, I guess, potentially greater responsibility on part of the bankers in not approving <laughs> number of applications, and I was wondering if you think that that is the case, or if there's evidence that it could just be that there was a, a constraint on the supply where banks just were not able to issue more loans due to capital requirements or other mm -hmm. uh, financial regulation. The beautiful part about the, this work is that we're taking as given that people, everybody, the banks and the borrowers are operating in their own best interests. Uh, so that we're, we're looking at this as sort of an equilibrium outcome where they've taken into account the potential for, e for the capital constraints and what have you. So that negative coefficient, actually, um, you see it here, uh, this negative coefficient on approvals for uh, prime versus subprime. Um, I, my tone of voice may have led you to believe that I thought that was a foolish thing. It's certainly no evidence that it's foolish at all. At, at all. Um, but it's... It's an interesting puzzle. I mean, we expected to see everybody lifting the floodgates and, every, and, and make, writing all these loans. And the, the notion that the, the, the prime uh, lenders were actually clamping down suggests that they were exercising uh, some you know, judgment about quality of loan that resulted in this net negative uh, <clears throat> rate. One here, last question. Yeah, question here. Uh, on this same slide, you also uh, implied that the, uh, the supply side, the, the bankers, were, were not accepting these over-leveraged um, mortgage applications as much as you would expect. But, but does your research indicate anything about how over-leveraged the banks were themselves in, in how much capital you know, they were taking out of the fund? Um, so the, ca um, the question you're ask asking really implies uh, 
uh, a, a point of view about um, uh, bank capital requirements. Um, and certainly, uh, I just used the data that I showed you, so we didn't use that uh, any information. As you know, this is a big spider web of different relationships um, that scales all the way up to the role of the government and the role of capital requirements and regulators. We just didn't, we didn't pay attention to all of that. Our job is not to put the thing together, but to, to, to see if we can f find certain pieces that help us understand whether decisions were good or bad. Thanks, Willis, a terrific lecture.